Okay, so um, maybe it's time to start. It's a pleasure to have this week uh, Simon Bradley, who's going to give the um, three uh, North lectures. Um, in fact, this one is the first, and let me remind you that the next one is on Wednesday at the same time, and the final one is on Friday, again at the same time. So, uh, uh, Simon is a, a great mathematician. He graduated uh, in 2001 um, in Tübingen under the supervision of Gerhard Wiesken, and on his way uh, to the uh, faculty at Stanford for roughly um, uh, 10 years, I believe, and then moving to Columbia. Where he is right now, he also passed actually through Princeton, where he was a uh, postdoc. So he has a number of um, uh, accomplishments and honors. Let me just mention the EMS Prize, the Gaucher Prize, the Fermat Prize, and uh, last year the uh, uh, Breakthrough Prize. And he's made a uh, uh, huge impact on uh, differential geometry, TDEs, and geometric analysis. Uh, let me just mention the uh, uh, first works on uh, the Yamabe flow. Uh, the uh, famous solution with Rick Shane of the uh, differentiable sphere theorem, uh, the solution of the Lawson conjecture on uh, 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 Clifford Tori, and um, uh, all the works on the singularity formations for uh, mean curvature flow and the uh, Ricci flow. And uh, uh, quite recently, um, uh, the topic that is going to be there on the screen for today's lectures that is the isoperimetric inequality on minima surfaces. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me give the word uh, to him. Thank you. I would like to thank Camilla for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here and see so many old friends. Um, in today's lecture, I want to discuss some results that link minimal surface theory and isoperimetric inequalities. So let me begin with the most basic case of the isoperimetric inequality in the Euclidean <laughs> space. So let's suppose that we have a compact domain E, and let's say it has smooth boundary, then we can bound the measure of the boundary of E from below by the scaling invariant power of the volume. And then there's a constant in front, which depends only on the dimension. And um, it is given by n times the volume of the unit ball to the power one over n. And so the significance of this constant is that equality is realized for um, a round ball in Euclidean space. Of course, this inequality, this can be generalized to more general sets, so you don't need E to have smooth boundary. You can generalize it to, to Kachopoli sets, for example. Um, this inequality is also related to a great many other inequalities in analysis and geometry. So, for example, this inequality, the isoperimetric inequality, is essentially equivalent to the sharp version of the Sokolov inequality. And it is also related to and is implied by the Brun Minkowski inequality. So, a special case of the Brun Minkowski inequality is the following statement that if you have a compact set E, compact domain in Rn, and then you look at this tubular neighborhood of E where you thicken E by including all the points that have distance at most R from the set E. And an equivalent way of saying the same thing is you take the set theoretic sum of E with a ball centered at the origin of radius R. And so then um, this thickening of E has volume um, given by volume of NR of E, and you can bound it from below in terms of the volume of E and the radius R. Now, in the limit, as you send the radius to zero, this will imply the isoperimetric inequality as a limiting case. And conversely, if you have an isoperimetric inequality, you get this inequality by integrating over R. So th this is essentially an equivalent statement. Um, I should say that mathematicians have developed many different techniques to study isoperimetric inequalities. So that this includes symmetrization techniques. It includes techniques from optimal transport, um, the so-called ABP technique that will 
come to later on in this lecture, and also techniques from the calculus of variations. Now, what I want to do next is I want to generalize the, the problem. And instead of looking at domains in Rn, I want to look at domains that sit in a curl submanifold of Euclidean space. And so this problem goes back to Thorsten Kallemann in a paper back in 1921. And so he, he asked the following question. Um, suppose that we have a minimal surface, um, in other words, a surface that has locally smallest area, or equivalently, that has mean curvature equal to zero. Then the question is, can you still bound the boundary measure of such a surface sigma from below by a constant times the measure of sigma to the scaling invariant power n minus one over n. And the goal here is to have exactly the same constant as in the Euclidean isoperimetric inequality. So that then in the special case when sigma sits in a linear n-dimensional subspace, then you will cover the Euclidean isoperimetric inequality. And in that case, uh, of course, the curl does no curvature. And then this is obviously minimal. So this problem has been studied with many different techniques. And so the earlier results, they use techniques from complex analysis. And the first result was proved by Kahleman himself. And he showed that you get a sharp in sharp isoperimetric inequality for two-dimensional minimal surfaces in R3 that are diffeomorphic to disks. So in that case, you can find a conformal parametrization by the disk and then call them these complex analytic techniques to prove the estimate. Now it turns out that um, you can weaken these assumptions and in, in the 1950s read show that you don't need to assume that the topological type is that of the disk, but it's enough to assume that sigma is connected boundary. And so this result, this is an adaptation of an even earlier result by Horowitz, where he proved the isoperimetric inequality in the plane by a very elementary argument. And so th that argument by Horowitz that turns out to extend to minimal surfaces. And what matters is the connectedness of the boundary. Then the next step was done by Shang in the 60s. And he showed that the co-dimension in this particular argument doesn't matter. And so it's enough to have a minimal surface of dimension two in a Euclidean space of any dimension and you still need connected boundary, which is crucial for this argument. Then Osserman and Schiffer in the 70s, they, for the first time, were able to go beyond connected boundary. And so, so they looked at annulus type surfaces. And then again, that was generalized to arbitrary co-dimension by Feinberg. And then you could then Li, Shane, and Yao show that you can go from this assumption that sigma is an annulus topologically, and you can replace that by the weaker assumption that sigma has two boundary components. And then that again was generalized to arbitrary co-dimension by Zhao back in 1990. And so, so this is, is a, this result by Zhao, this is the most general result to my knowledge that you can prove with these two-dimensional arguments. Now, let me mention some results in a completely different direction. So Algren in 1986 was able to prove the inequality under the assumption that sigma is an absolute minimizer of area. So there are no assumptions on dimension or co-dimension, but you need an absolute minimizer. Now, the difference between a minimal surface and an area minimizer is that um, a minimal surface is, by definition, um, is a surface that is a stationary point, a critical point for the area functional. So it doesn't have to be a, a minimizer. It could be a saddle point. It could have non-trivial 
moss index, or it, it could be stable, but not minimizing. So all these possibilities are allowed in a minimal surface. All we need is vanishing mean curvature. And, but here, the assumption is replaced by this much stronger assumption that you have an absolute minimizer of area, and then it turns out that the inequality is true. And this result by Armgren, this should be viewed as a sharp version of a filling inequality by Federer and Fleming. So the way to think about Armgren's inequality is that you give yourself a boundary and then you ask how much volume do you need to fill in a given cycle. And there's a non-sharp inequality by Federer and Fleming and Armgren obtain the optimal constant in that inequality. In all of this, all what regularity is assumed. So here, I assume everything is smooth. So many of these arguments can be generalized, but let's keep it simple. There's another direction which, is, which has been very influential in geometry, um, which is the so-called Michael Simon inequality. And so this one, this holds on any submanifold any dimension and any co-dimension. And the surface doesn't even have to be minimal, but then you have to include an extra term involving the mean curvature. But in the special case when the mean curvature is zero, it gives you a, an isoperimetric inequality. The only catch is that this inequality doesn't give you a sharp constant. So it's more in the spirit of the federal Fleming result in the sense that it um, as a non-sharp constant. However, it, it, it doesn't require um, the surface to be a minimized surface area. It works with zero mean curvature, and you can even replace, remove that condition if you are willing to put in an extra term. And so there are two proofs of that by Allard and by Michael Simon independently. They're very similar. They use covering arguments in geometric measure theory. And then much later, Castillon found a proof that used optimal transport. And this is more related to what I will discuss in today's lecture. Okay, so, so after this, um, these background results, let, let me talk about the result I want to show you today. So um, let's suppose that sigma is a compact n-dimensional manifold. In, embedded in Rn plus M, and it may have boundary, but it could also be closed, free of boundary, otherwise fine. Then I can prove this lower bound for the combination of the boundary measure of sigma and the L1 norm of the mean curvature. And so this particular combination, this can be bounded from below by the scaling invariant power of the volume. And then there's a particular constant that depends on the dimension and the co-dimension. And this requires the dimension to be, at, the co-dimension, excuse me, to be at least two. But in co-dimension one, the result applies as well, because you can simply add an extra dimension to your ambient space. Okay, so there are two things that I want to draw your attention to. So first of all, this inequality, like the one proved by Allard and Michael Simon, doesn't require zero mean curvature. So it holds for any submanifold, and it includes this mean curvature term on the left-hand side. But in the special case, when sigma is minimal, then the mean curvature term vanishes, and it reduces to an isoperimetric inequality. Now, the second and crucial point is that in the special case, when the co-dimension is one, then um, the well-known recursive formula for the volume of the n-dimensional unique ball, this tells you that this ratio here, this reduces to the volume of Bn. And so this means in this case, when the co-dimension is two, this reduces to the sharp constant, the same constant that you would get in the Euclidean isoperimetric inequality. And so the constant is sharp in co-dimension two. And 
In particular, it's also shot in co-dimension one, then since this is a special case. And so then in co-dimension two, you get this result, which has a sharp constant. Um, another point that's worth mentioning is that the terms on the left-hand side, they are kind of natural to put together because they scale in the same way. So the boundary measure scales um, like n minus one dimensional volume, and then the integral of mean curvature, since mean curvature scales like one over length, that scales like n minus one dimensional volume as well. So this is a very natural combination to form, um, as has already been recognized when, by Michael and Simon. When, when you say so, can one tell when to equality, equality is reached? Yes, so the equality holds for any um, flat round disk. So if you have a, an n-dimensional linear subspace, you get equality. And I can prove the converse as well. So that this is the only way you can achieve equality. Right, so, so let me tell you the, the basic idea of the argument. So what, what I'm going to say in the next few minutes is not rigorous. And I'm going to tell you how to make it rigorous later on. But let, let me give you the idea first. So the, the idea is to use optimal transport, but there's a twist. And so in optimal mass transport, what you normally do is you have two domains in a ring, or more generally, two manifolds of the same dimension, typically. And then you have a cost function. And then what you want to do is you want to, let's say, with two sets x and y, and with a cost function from x plus y to r, the interpretation being that this is the cost um, <clears throat> for transporting an infinitesimal piece of mass from a point x in the first space to a point y in the second space. And then you want to integrate over x plus with y the transport cost C of X and Y with respect to a probability measure pi. So this would be a probability measure on X cross Y. And this pi, this would represent a transport problem. And so then the, we want to minimize this problem. And then the constraint is that this probability measure pi, this has given prescribed marginal distributions on x and y. So you specify two measures on x and y, and then you can look at probability measures on the product that have these given marginal distributions on x and y, and then in the class of all these transport lines pi, each probability measure would represent a transport line, then you would minimize the cost. And so the standard example would be that x and y are equal to our end, and the cost function, that would be the quadratic cost. So you could take minus the inner product of x and y, and that, that, that would be equivalent to taking a half x minus y squared. And then this will give you the standard optimal transport problem with quadratic cost. Now here, and so, so the, this type of technique, this can be used to prove the isoperimetric inequality in RN, and that has been recognized in the 90s by McCann. Now here, in the context of submanifolds, the idea is to still look at a transport problem, but we want to set it up as a transport problem between spaces of different dimensions. And so in most of the transport literature, you, you look at problems between spaces of equal dimensions. Now, let me tell you the spaces we want to look at here. So the idea is we take our submanifold. Let's say this is our submanifold. And then we put on it the Riemannian volume measure. So, so this is our first space. And then the second space, this is the ambient ball, Vn plus n. 
equipped with a mesh alarm dot. And so this is for you, Paul. So, so we look at a problem where one space is n-dimensional and the other one is n plus n-dimensional. And now the cost function, maybe let me write it as c of x and psi, I take that to be minus x of psi for x in sigma and psi in the ambient ball. Uh, equivalently, I could take um, a half long x minus psi squared. That's a really good equivalent problem. <laughs> so we look at a problem with quadratic costs and between the submanifold and an ambient ball. And this one, that this will be a measure on the ball, but I want to leave open the choice of the measure for now. So we'll, so that this will be chosen to be rotationally invariant, but I will make the choice later. Now in the theory of optimal transport, you can pass to a dual problem, which is called the Kenko-Ovich problem. And then the optimizer, the minimizer of the dual problem, this gives a scalar function u on this submanifold sigma. And the significance of it is the following. So maybe let me sketch very briefly how it would work if you had a domain E in Rn. So let's say for domain E in Rn, you would map it to the unit ball Bn, right? And this is your domain E. And so then if you look at this Kantorovich dual problem, the significance is that you would be convex and a point X that would be transported to a point grad U of X, given by grad U of X. So the optimal map would be the gradient mapping of a function U, and this function U is the solution of the Kantorovich dual problem. Now here, um, we go back to the setting of a problem with unequal dimension of a submanifold that we want to transport to a measure on B n plus n. What would happen is you still have this potential U, and then what would happen is you would have your submanifold sigma, and you would have the ball B n plus n. And then basically you can ask what points on the ball get mapped to a given point x. And so the answer is what gets mapped to x, um, this is a set that's contained in an affine subspace. And this affine subspace, this is, um, this is parallel to the normal space. So if you have a point x in sigma and a normal vector y, then basically the point x um, corresponds to this entire affine subspace that's parallel to the normal space and it's translated by gradient u. And so kind of we have n-dimensional fibers that get collapsed to points. Now in the standard setup of optimal transport between spaces of equal dimension, then the, wall, but the fact that this gradient map resolves the volume this leads to a more strong pair equation for this potential. Now here, um, you get some sort of analog of the more strong pair equation, but it's not quite as neat and clean. It's a kind of non-local equation. And essentially it expresses the fact that the push forward of the measure lambda on the ball under this um, map that I um, showed here gives you the volume measure on sigma. So, that, so that's basically this condition of compatibility of the measures, and that gives you sort of the appropriate analog of the motion pair equation. Okay, so then <clears throat> um, what we want to do is from the motion pair equation, which I will not write down as it's somewhat complicated, you can get a bound for the Laplacian of u plus norm h, and then you integrate that over the submanifold sigma, and then in that way you can get a bound for the norm, for, for the L1 norm of h, and then the integral of the Laplacian gives you a boundary term that you can estimate in terms of the 
Ombre Mesha of Sigma. And so, so this is roughly the way um, you would prove the inequality using optimal transform. Right, now, <clears throat> there are a couple of points here. So first of all, this argument is not rigorous because I haven't told you anything about the regularity of this optimal map and the regularity of the solution of the Kentorovich dual problem. Another point is I haven't told you um, how I want to choose the mesh or lambda. And so this comes back to the problem that we want to get equality in the model case of a flat round disk. So, so let's say this argument works. And then if you run this argument in the special case when sigma is a flat round disk, then we need to get equality. And basically in order for that to work, the optimal map needs to have a particular structure. And so, so I want to choose the measure lambda so that in the model case when sigma is a flat disk in dimension n, then I want the potential to be one half norm x squared. I want to be I want the potential to be very simple. And then for this potential, the transport map is just the orthogonal projection that collapses a higher dimensional ball to a lower dimensional ball. And so, so th this is what the optimal map should look like in the model case if the argument is su supposed to have a chance of working. Now you can kind of from here reverse engineer the measure. If this is supposed to be the optimal map, then well, you should choose the measure lambda so that the projection is measure preserving. And so then that leads to the question, well, can you choose lambda in such a way that we push forward of lambda under this orthogonal projection from the higher dimensional ball to the lower dimensional ball gives you the Levesque measure on the lower dimensional ball. And we want to get the Levesque measure because that's the volume measure in, in that special, on sigma, in that special case. Now, this shows you why the choice of, of this measure is delicate, because if you take make the naive choice and choose lambda to be the Lebesgue measure upstairs in dimension n plus m, then the projected measure will assign too little uh, weight to points in the other boundary. So to counteract that, you have to choose lambda so that you assign more measure to the boundary of the ball in order for the projection to hopefully the end, give you an even distribution, a uniform distribution. Now, in low co-dimension, you can work out the right choices. So in co-dimension one, the right measure has this density that blows up on the boundary given by one over root one minus long psi squared. Now, in co-dimension two, you can just barely find such a measure. And the right measure is one where all the mass sits on the boundary. And in dimension at least three, um, I cannot find such a measure. And that's why in co-dimension at least three, I can get an inequality, but I cannot get a sharp constant. So the idea is any choice of the measure will give me some inequality, but in order for the constant to be sharp, the measure needs to have this particular property. And so I can do it up to co-dimension two. Okay, so this is how we want to choose the measure. No, me, yes. What is your choice in, in co-dimension three and higher? Is still the... So I would put as much measure as I yeah, can to the boundary. So I would make, oops, I would make the same choice as in co-dimension two. And I believe that's the best you can do. And at least it makes intuitive sense. I haven't proved that this is the best choice that gives you the best constant you can get with this technique, but it, it seems plausible that that should be the case. Now, let me turn to the other aspect, which is how can we make all of this rigorous? And there are two ways you can do it. So one way is to, to make the optimal transport approach work. And in that case, the way you would do it is you would work with Alexandrov derivatives. So this solution of the Kantorovich 
dual problem. This is a semi-convex function. In fact, it's a very nice function. It's obtained by taking a convex function in ambient space and restricting it to sigma. So that's the natural kind of convexity um, you can get in this problem. And in particular, it's semi-convex. And then by a classical form of Alexandrov, you have second derivatives almost everywhere. And with some work, it turns out you can make it make the argument work using these Alexandrov second derivatives. And this is a, 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 in a paper um, by Michael Eichmeier and myself from 2022. Now, my original proof of the result from 2019, that used a different method. And so this was inspired by the optimal transport approach, but it did not actually use optimal transport. And so instead, it uses an argument based on the Alexander of Buckelman Pucci maximum principle, which um, was used in different situations by Trudinger and Capre. And thus there are also connections with uh, volume estimates for cubes, which is a very classical subject in differential geometry. So let me explain in, in, in just a few words the difference between the two approaches. So in the, let's say, if you look at the problem between a domain E in Rn and a ball, and let's say you want to prove the Euclidean isoperimetric inequality. So then what you would do in the optimal transport approach is you would solve the Mosh on pair equation. So you would solve this PDE with the right boundary condition, and then you would deduce that in the Laplace view is at least n by the arithmetic geometric mean inequality. Now in the ADP approach, you can turn the roles of these two PDEs around. So you solve Laplace view equal to n, and you deduce that you get an inequality in Marshall pair. So, so, so the, the two approaches are in a way dual to one another. And in you always have these two PDEs, the most on pair equation and a linear PDE, and you always solve one with inequality and get an inequality in the other. And so what you can do here is instead of solving the transport problem and solving this most on pair equation, you can instead get away with solving a linear PDE. So it's a very, the, the arguments are very similar, but then you can you can rely on the existence theory for linear PDE. So here's how it works. So first of all, you can reduce to the case that sigma is connected. Otherwise, you just sum over the connected components. And then by scaling, I can arrange that the boundary area plus the L1 norm of H is equal to n times the volume of sigma. And I can do that because these two things on the left and right hand side scale differently. So I can put any constant on the right, but n is convenient and makes the formulas look nice. Okay, now here in the next step, what we want to do is we want to solve this Neumann problem for linear PDE. So on sigma, on the submanifold, I solve a Neumann problem where Laplace, sigma is the Laplace op operator on the submanifold. And then I prescribe the normal derivative on the boundary to be equal to one. And eta, this is my co normal vector on the boundary. So not a normal to sigma, but a, the normal to the boundary lying in sigma. Now, on a connected manifold, there's one constraint to the solvability of this problem. And so there's an obvious constraint coming from the divergence term. And as long as that constraint is satisfied, you can solve this problem. And so this um, assumption that we arranged by, to be true by scaling, this ensures the solvability of that PDE. And so, so I can solve that. 
And so then what I want to do is I want to set up a map that is reminiscent of the transport map. Yeah, so I define these sets. So omega is the set of all points where the gradient has one less than one, the other points we don't care about. Then I look at pairs of points or, um, where you have a point on the surface and a normal vector such that the norm squared of the gradient plus the norm squared of the normal vector is less than one. And then I want to restrict to a, a kind of context set where the Hessian of you minus a second fundamental form term is non-negative. So th this is an important point on a technical level, but let's not worry too much about it at this point. Now, the really important point is this map. So I define a map that takes a point in a normal bundle and maps it to a point in ambient space. And I take the other gradient of u plus y. Now, the motivation of this comes exactly from this discussion of optimal transport. Because if instead of solving this Neumann problem, if instead I solve the optimal transport problem, then this phi would tell you your optimal transport plan. And so here, I set up the same kind of map, except that I don't use the solution of the Kantorovich problem, but I use a solution of a linear PDE. And so then that maps into the unit ball, since we're looking at pairs x, y, where norm squared of gradient u plus norm y squared is less than one. Okay, now here are the, the essential properties of this map. So this, so first of all, this map is surjective. Then you can compute its Jacobian determinant, and it, so the n plus one dimension n plus n dimensional Jacobian determinant reduces basically to the determinant of the Hessian of u, but it does an extra term that has to do with the extrinsic curvature of the surface. And then the third very important point is that as a result of u solving this PDE, the Jacobian determinant is between zero and one. And so, so this means this phi, this is subjective, it's orientation preserving, and it's measure among increasing. So it compresses measure. And so maybe let me sketch very briefly how these, how these lemmata are proof, and then from there we can put together the proof of the inequality. So, so let's begin with this activity. So, so remember that the map is, let me write it maybe here. So the map would take a pair xy to gradient u, which is a tangent vector, plus this vector y, which lies in the normal bundle. Right, and so to prove subjectivity, um, let's assume we have a, a vector xi in the unit ball, and then what I do is I subtract off this linear function from u, so that this is a linear function in ambient space, and I restrict it to the submanifold, and then because of the Neumann boundary condition for u, this function w has positive normal derivative on the boundary, and that tells us that this function cannot have a um, a boundary minimum. So th this means it must have an interior minimum. And then the first order conditions at a minimum tell you exactly that grad u plus some vector y equals xi. So basically, the way you can prove such activity is you give yourself a vector in ambient space of norm less than one, and then you minimize this function. And then the minimum will tell you the pre-image of xi under this map. And then the second order condition for a minimum, this gives you the extra information that the pre-image lies in the subset A that I defined on the previous slide Yeah, And so I can find a pre-image under the map phi, and the pre-image in addition lies in the subset A. And so then, so that's essentially how you would prove this first step. 
And then for the second step, well, you introduce local coordinates, you look at the Jacobian matrix of phi, and then what you find is that it breaks up into blocks. So <clears throat> you have like one block that reduces to the Hessian of you, and then with this additional second fundamental form term, then another block is the identity, and then the matrix is not symmetric. So you have one off-diagonal block that's zero, and then there's a second off-diagonal block that is non-trivial, but it doesn't really matter since we're only interested in the determinant. And so then the Jacobian determinant reduces to the determinant basically of the Hessian minus the second fundamental form term. So that's how you can compute that. And then what really matters is this last statement that this map that I construct, that is this um, mesh or non-increasing. And so in a way, this last statement, um, this is the analog of the most unpaired equation in this setting. So like in the ABP approach, we solve a linear PDE with equality, but here in this problem, there's a mean curvature term, and then we get an inequality in, in a certain most unpaired equation. And Basically, this is hidden in this third lemma. <coughs> okay, so, so let me explain how this works. So let's consider a point x, y, and then this normal vector y must have length less than one. And so then using Cauchy-Schwarz, you can estimate the trace of this symmetric bilinear form. And so you would the, the trace would give you the Laplacian of u minus a mean curvature term, and then you just estimate the mean curvature term by the norm of the mean curvature. But <clears throat> in the way we set up the problem, um, remember that the Laplacian of u, this is equal to n minus norm h. And so then here you get Laplacian of u plus norm h, and so then this is at most n. And so then you have this symmetric bilinear form. It's weakly positive definite. It has trace equal to n. And so then the arithmetic geometric mean inequality tells us that the determinant is between zero and one. And the determinant, this is exactly the Jacobian determinant of our map V. And so then that shows that the that the, the, the map is mesh or non increasing. Okay, so now let me tell you about the final step in the proof. So now we're putting everything together. And this is basically where this mesh or lambda comes into play. So you, you, you don't see the lambda on this, um, on this page, but it's, it's hidden. And let me explain how. So essentially, what I want to do. I want to take an integral over bn plus n with respect, let's say, one d lambda. And then I want to estimate this in terms of um, the change of variables formula, and I bring in the map b. Now, what, I'm, what I do here is I look at a measure that's has density one on a thin annulus of outer radius one and inner radius sigma. And so, so this is just for technical convenience. So the idea is if I make sigma very close, if I choose sigma very close to one, then this measure on this thin annulus will approximate after suitable rescaling the boundary measure on the sphere. And remember, this is how we want to choose the measure if the co-dimension is at least two. We want to choose a measure lambda that assigns all the mass to the boundary. And so on a technical level, a convenient way of doing it <clears throat> is to look at a measure that has constant density on an annulus um, of inner radius sigma and outer radius one, and then I send sigma to one from below. And so here, this choice of the measure is implicit in this calculation. All right, and so, so then let's use the change of variables formula. 
So then I can bound this by an integral over the normal bundle and I get the absolute value of the Jacobian determinant. And then I, I only need to integrate over the subset A. And the only reason this is important is that my estimate for the Jacobian determinant is only valid on that subset. So that's why I want to make sure that I only integrate over that subset where the estimate holds. And this is possible because the restriction of phi to the map to the set A is subjective. And so then here you can estimate the Jacobian determinant by one, and then you just work out what the integral is. <clears throat> and so you get this complicated looking integral involving the gradient of u. And now what you can do in the next step is you can just use an elementary inequality that b to the m over 2 minus a to the m over 2 is bounded by m over 2 b minus a for a and b less than 1. And then you can bound this integrand just by m over 2 times 1 minus sigma squared. <clears throat> and of course, this quantity I'm estimating here, that's exactly the quantity that appears here in the, in, in the change of variables formula. Right. Now, this may look like a crude estimate, but the, the, the point to remember is that in, if m is 2, then this is an equality trivially. And so, so that, that again shows why you get equality for m equal to 2. So if the co-dimension is 2, you're not throwing away anything. And if the co-dimension is greater than 2, then well, you're throwing something away, but it's still a valid inequality. And so then if you use that bound, well, you arrive at this conclusion. You can bound the volume of this m plus m dimensional annulus of inner radius sigma and outer radius 1 by 1 minus sigma squared times a, a constant that depends on the co-dimension times the measure of omega. All right, so now what this tells you is that you get a lower bound for the measure of omega, and you get one for every sigma, but the best bound you get if you send sigma to one. So in the, in the limit, as you send sigma to one, you, you, you get the best bound, and that's not surprising because in this case, the measure reduces to the surface measure on the sphere, which we recognized earlier is a good choice to make and it's the best choice to make in co-dimension two. And so then um, this leads to a lower bound for the measure of sigma with a certain constant. And so then once you have the lower bound for the measure of sigma, then you're really done because um, if you look at the left-hand side in the inequality, well, by the normalization, that's n times the measure of sigma. And then I simply break that up into a product of the measure of sigma to the power one over n, which I estimate using the lower bound from the previous page, times the measure of sigma to the power n minus one over n. And then you get the inequality with exactly the constant um, I stated earlier, and in co-dimension two, the inequality is sharp for the reasons I mentioned. And so, so this finishes the argument. Now, in the remaining couple of minutes, let me just tell you about some related results you can prove. So the, the first one is a very Direct, it's a very simple co corollary. If the mean curvature vanishes, if you are on a minimal um, surface, then um, the mean curvature drops out and you, you get this isoperimetric inequality. Um, the second point is you get an analog of the brun minkowski inequality, which is kind of interesting because um, like the, the brun minkowski inequality tells you something about tubular neighborhoods, but how do you take tubular neighborhoods for a submanifold? And so here's how you can make sense of that. So let's say we have a compact 
submanifold, and let's say we have a domain in this submanifold, and then we look at the tubular neighborhood in ambient space. So this is just the tubular neighborhood <coughs> of the set defined in the usual sense in ambient space, set of all points in ambient space that have distance from E um, at most R. Okay, so then I take that tubular neighborhood and I intersect it with sigma. Then I get a, a region in sigma, and then I can bound the measure of the intersection by the bound you would expect. So, so in the special case, when E lies in a linear subspace, this reduces exactly to the inequality we had before. And again, in the limiting case, as you send R to zero, this inequality reduces to the earlier one, to the isoperimetric inequality. And conversely, this inequality, you can derive from the isoperimetric one by integrating over R. Another special case is, so of this inequality is a very classical fact about minimal surfaces. So that's a very basic fact that if I have a minimal surface sigma, with boundary in a ball, right? Then the measure of sigma intersected with a ball, the R, this is at least, and let's say this passes through the origin, then this is at least the volume of the n dimensional unit ball times R to the n. And so, so this is usually both using the monotonicity formula for minimal surfaces. Now, this bond you get as a trivial special case of that inequality when E is a point. So even when E is a point, this reduces to something well known, but something non-trivial. Okay, and then <clears throat> maybe in the last step, let me mention that all of these results can be generalized to a Riemannian setting. So, so far, we considered submanifolds of Euclidean space, but you can also allow the ambient space to be a Riemannian manifold rather than um, a Euclidean space. And this may seem surprising at first because in these transport arguments, we use the gradient both as a vector field and also as a map. And this dual interpretation as a vector field and a map, this doesn't work in a Riemannian manifold. But it turns out that um, it still works. And what you would do is you would consider a transport problem and you would use as your cost function the squared Riemannian distance. And then you would map your submanifold to a huge geodesic ball and you would take the limit as the radius of the ball goes to infinity. And then the inequality would pick up the asymptotic volume ratio at infinity. So it would reduce to like information about volume of, of large geodesic balls. And then this volume ratio would tell you the constant in the inequality. And this is related to things that, um, to, to, to a problem that Professor Huston talked about in his Morse lecture in this room many years ago. And he obtained similar results, but using completely different techniques. And I guess that is a good place to end. Thank you. Questions? In this uh, Riemannian case, you want to go not too much curvature. And if it is constant curvature, you will get nothing, I expect, because if you take an easy ball, it's. That's right. So. If the so the, the asymptotic volume ratio could be so, so like if you are on a paraboloid, then this wouldn't give you anything because the volume growth is zero. So it would give you a non-trivial piece of information for manifolds asymptotic to counts. But if, if you have too much curvature and it doesn't um, open up enough, you would get no information whatsoever. I must say, I'd like an example. What are the kind of surface one has to worry about uh, 
to have a, a small uh, boundary? Are there some examples to keep in mind? That's a good question. I mean, in the, even in the two-dimensional case, I think the scenario that people worried about, well, surfaces with many boundary components, and so that, so even, even to, today, this cannot be handled using the complex analytic techniques. And I mean, this approach I discussed, this works well in low code dimension. So if you have like a 2D surface in R10 and you have many boundary components, we still don't know if, if there's a sharp isoperimetric inequality. But it's, I mean, I would expect it to be true, but it's, it's very hard to imagine what could go wrong if you have many boundary components. Actually, because you're, uh, you know, because you uh, proved the uh, sharp inequality for the Michael Simon, right? Uh, you expect it to be true in higher co-dimension, even by including the Michael Simon term? Or that's a good question. I mean, it would be great if it's true, but. It's hard to tell. I mean, the, the, the classical techniques, I think, have no way of giving you the sharp constant since they're based on covering arguments. And this technique doesn't seem to give you um, a sharp constant beyond if you go beyond co-dimension two. So it's completely would, open. Would the uh, kind of classical techniques which are using complex analysis actually say something on the Michael Simon inequality no, as well? Or is it completely? For minimal surfaces. This is only for minimal surfaces. They don't give you the minimal give you anything for the minimal side. So and, and how um how much say singularity in your object could you actually uh, push through if you were to say I take sigma, which is not exactly completely smooth, just a third in, in oh, this is the question I meant to ask you <laughs> during our next discussion. Oh okay. I mean, about the yeah. classical. <laughs> Yeah. But classical results, I mean, they all were for very false. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly. I think one would hope that one can get the sharp constant for very false. But I mean, so far, I, I mean, I can do it in the smooth case. Maybe for mild singularities, it could go through, but it would be great to do it for very false. Uh, so in the last theorem, is theta is equal to zero, so which means that man doesn't have massive volume growth. I will say anything about the boundary. I can't say anything, and um, I think there's a reason for that because, yeah, I mean, imagine this inequalities. So I also have a Michael Simon inequality in this setting, and so for example, what this tells you is that. You cannot have a closed minimal surface because for a closed minimal surface, the left hand side is zero. Now imagine you have something that's op that opens up like a cylinder. So let's say I have a piece of a cylinder and I glue in a cap. So now this sigma here, this would be closed and minimal. And so, so then it would contradict the inequality if the coefficient on the right was not zero. And if you have something that opens up, sort of less, that has less volume growth than a common, then I think, I mean, then there must exist surfaces where the boundary area is much less than the enclosed volume to the power n minus one over n. Otherwise, you would have too much volume growth. I mean, otherwise, you could apply it to geodesic faults, and then it would give you an ODE for the volume growth. So I think this is essentially optimal. I mean, the only chance to do something would be to change the exponent and to be content. So sort of if you have less volume growth, then may maybe you use a different function of the volume. And maybe there's a way to estimate the isoperimetric profile, but I don't have anything to report. Can you add certain weight to this Michael Simon subject in the data? Yes, I believe that's possible. So, first of all, for the previous inequality, um, for which needs no negative Ricci, so here you can replace Ricci curvature by the Bakri Emery 
reach ecology and you can put in a white. And one of my uh, former postdocs at Columbia, Florian Yone, he, he worked out how to do it. And now for the Michael Simon inequality, for that I need non negative sexual curvature. And so then if you put in a white, you will need some information about the action of the white. And I think it's possible to do it, but I think it will not look as neat as the result for Ritchie curvature. It will be more complicated to state. Okay, so um, we got lots of questions, but uh, of course we can keep asking uh, Simon question at uh, the tea, which uh, is about to be served. Thank you again.